time just off the cuff to respond to an article I thought was really helpful written by Tim Keller. Um, he wrote this article where he outlined some of the divisions actually that are happening in the church right now. And they're pretty obvious. And I think anybody who is engaging within the church genuinely is feeling these divisions. Um, I think, you know, obviously since the past two years, there have been new divisions revealed even like where people are separated because of different convictions about some certain key things, which somebody, you know, like myself would hope some of those things could be secondary, but it looks to be that maybe they're not. And here's a chart that Tim Keller um, put together. I'm going to go off the cuff, just responding to it because it just really helped me make a lot of sense of a lot of things. I'm going to put, a, again, the link to these articles. You can read them for yourself. They're a little lengthy, very technical, but I think very helpful. And uh, here's the chart that Tim Keller set up. He essentially said, okay, you got this spectrum of left to right, right? You can kind of understand that it's somewhat, you know, political because this is America. We are politically divided. You know, all the way on the right, and again, I'm actually flipping his chart around because I want it to be left and right. I don't know if he meant for that or not, but all the way on the right, you have fundamentalism, right? You have essentially people that are hard right conservative, right? You have that whole culture, right? And then about right here, you know, you have evangelical, right? And then you have this dividing line in the middle, right? That's the center line politically to some degree, right? And then over here you have like main line, which would be, you know, essentially progressive denominations and things like that, progressive Christians, right? And then you have the nuns. And what this is, is, you know, people that are religiously unaffiliated. You know, all the way over here you have fundamentalism and ultra right conservatism all the way over here you have complete secularism right and tim keller even makes the argument and you got to look at his article it's really helpful where he even says like people on the extreme sides of both sides are are almost similar in that they're completely separatist they are moralists like they think that their way is the only way and the other side's totally wrong and things like that and he gets into that but we're not going to get into that today we're just going to talk about this divide um a lot and we're going to talk about this a little bit too because again i think this is pretty pertinent to our time like have you noticed somehow recently that evangelicalism and fundamentalism have kind of become intertwined to some degree i've seen this trend happen now in the 2000s and the 2010s i almost felt like you know evangel evangelicalism and fundamentalism were separate things if you look at fundamentalism and evangelicalism historically you see that evangelicals broke off of fundamentalism like 30s 40s 50s era mostly in the 50s prominently because they wanted to actually socially engage the culture with the gospel they wanted to reach people who didn't know jesus with the gospel and they felt that fundamentalists were too separatist too racist too uh exclusive like nobody's allowed in and completely like inclusive of each other and refused to engage the world and just kind of wanted to condemn the world and there was this separation but what happened over the past couple of years and i think in particular over the past six years you could see it a lot and maybe it was rising until then is there's sort of like a tie between evangelicalism and fundamentalism again now this is important to bring this in and this is the part where i know like a lot of folks like probably had a hard time um especially in the world in white evangelicalism because we got to understand like evangelicalism is a white phenomenon it's a white movement like black christians were not included in the beginning conversations about the evangelical movement right like it, it was never like a black and a white thing like it was always a white movement we got to understand that and the black church has uh, functioned very separate you know, from these things, like from mainline Christianity, which is entirely progressive, essentially, and goes all on that side and rebels against this side to some extent. Not in every case, there's always nuance, but in a lot of cases. And then 
you know, they were separate from evangelicalism because evangelicalism was a white movement. A lot of black folks wanted to sit down at the table in their early conversations about this, I believe, in the 1910s and were welcome at the table. So the black church was always separated. Historically, it was made a minority, historically was exiled from white Christianity, like all through slavery, all through Jim Crow, all through segregation. And up until the civil rights bills were passed, there had been such a generational reality there that still Martin Luther King is right that Sunday is the most segregated hour of the week. The black church and the white church are separated. There are lots of multi-ethnic efforts like in the 90s and the 2000s. There have been a lot of efforts made to try to bring uh, that together. But again, like because of the uh, hard stances sometimes over here, you know, and like the inability to have nuance, the separation has continued. Now, one thing I have to say is that I have found myself to really identify theologically and socially with the black church over these past few years. And I think I always did. I just think like, now I realize that I really agree. Because like when I talk to my black Christian friends about faith, right? Like black pastors that I know, black nonprofit leaders, people of color that, you know, are of faith. You know, we'll talk about the basic Nicene Creed stuff. Like, do you believe that like, Jesus is the only way, like there's no other God but Jesus. There's, you know, no other way but Jesus. Oh, yeah, totally agree. Do we believe like in the Trinity? Yeah. Like believe in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? Separate but equal? Yeah. Like not totally equal, not totally separate? Yeah. Like all these basic Nicene Creed doctrinal things. Like you believe in virgin birth? Yes. I mean, do you believe in you know, sola scriptura, or like this, and the black church wouldn't call it that, but do you believe in the authority of scripture? Yeah. I mean, do you believe like that God's word is the complete authority? Of course. Do you believe in the humanity and deity of Christ? Yes. We believe he was fully God and fully man. We don't believe he was completely man. Don't believe he was completely God, right? All these basic things. And the black church, even like on the complementarian and the egalitarian issue are, they can be somewhat divided about that just as much as evangelicalism is. So we have all these things in common. And again, fundamentalism would agree with all these things as well, right? But then they add like additional political and cultural things, right? Now, here's where it gets strange because like the black church historically has always dipped a little bit socially into this realm where the main line church really emphasizes things and completely pushes against evangelicalism and fundamentalism to some degree, like in its most pure extreme like forms. Right. And this is where it comes down to issues. Like and when I talk to my black Christian friends about them, like on the same page, man, understood when I talk to some of my evangelical friends, they're like, uh, I, I won't go there. Right. And then, man, when I talk to people that have a fundamentalist bent, they're like, man, how dare you even say that or talk about that? And again, evangelicalism and fundamentalism have been a little bit more tied together. Like Tim Keller actually proposes the idea that maybe we ought to revamp the term fundamentalism. Maybe we ought to bring that back to identify this division again, because there's been too much of a blurry line between these two lately, right? And what I'm talking about, when I'm talking about dipping over the center into the liberal realm, oh, how dare we? We got to talk about this. We got to talk about it to really discover things. It's issues like, you know, the LGBTQ issue. Now, when I talk to my black Christian friends about the LGBTQ community, we agree. It's like we want to love the LGBTQ community really well. The church has failed at loving the LGBTQ community completely like we we haven't built that bridge. We haven't built friendships. We haven't cared for people well. We haven't like invited people over to dinner enough and like built bridges. And we just need to love people because like God's grace is so good. And Jesus's ministry was inclusive of everybody, but he did have like a holiness too. And like still believe in that, you know, historic sola scriptura, like orthodox Belief in scripture, yes, we hold to that holiness, that sexual purity ethic, but there needs to be love. And again, when you go here, people here and here just get mad at you. 
they're, they're like, don't talk about it. Don't talk about it. Don't mention it. Don't say it. And I think it's more for political reasons than biblical reasons, because I think it's better to talk about these things biblically than to ignore them. Don't you? And same thing, like when it comes to abortion, okay? Like this goes over the line into here. So again, when I talk to my black Christian friends, my friends of color in the church, they're like, well, yeah, I mean, like I'm pro-life. Like when it comes to like protecting like births of babies, like in every case, I would want babies to be born. I would never want a pregnancy to be terminated ever, like under any circumstance. But I also see the social issues that lead to women having abortions, like financial issues, you know, women that can't afford to have a kid or like they got raped or terrible things happen. And like in so, so many circumstances, like in particularly the city community, the community of the city, like people like feel forced into this in order to like cope or in order to survive. And we need to give grace to the women and we need to change the economic structures that prevent women from having good choices to make about that and feeling pressured or forced to have to make a drastic decision that might traumatize them. So it's a more robust conversation. But again, when you talk about it at all, even as I've just talked about it, which I believe was pretty balanced, pretty articulate, you know, I'm not trying to put myself on a pedestal, but I feel pretty good about what I just said. That's pretty balanced. That's pretty biblical. That affirms the fact that, yes, we were knitted in our mother's womb by God and like God cares about the unborn, but also God cares about everybody and God cares about every circumstance and there's grace for everybody, right? Whenever you talk about it, people over here get mad now. They get angry and it's more for, for political reasons because you're crossing the line into the realm of the Democrat. How dare you? Don't talk about that stuff. Leave it alone. Be neutral about it so you don't upset people. And sometimes that comes down to like, don't upset the people that are, you know, giving money to the church. Don't upset people that are members. Don't upset people that are in leadership that have a say. And man, that, we shouldn't be afraid to talk about these things biblically and robustly and balanced and have good dialogue. You follow me? And again, man, you could bet. Well, first I'll talk about this because this is an interesting one. The poor, all right? Now, in the 2000s, when I was in evangelicalism, all right, there was a push within evangelicalism, within white evangelicalism, to care about the poor. The emergent church was happening. The emerging church was happening. Uh, they were trying to reach out to the poor. They were seeing in scripture how important that was. People like Shane Claiborne were going out and literally living among the homeless to reach out to people, to bless the streets, because they were seeing this in scripture. There's so much scripture that talks about this. Jesus had such a ministry to the poor. The Psalms scream of it. The Proverbs scream of it. Prophets scream of it. You know, the Gospels and the New Testament and the book of Acts screams of it. And Paul's ministry screams of it. On and on we could go. And again, like, I remember, like, advocating for the poor during the 2000s. And so many people in evangelicalism were mad at me because they felt like it was crossing the line into the realm of the Democrat. You follow me? And again, I'm not advocating for being a Democrat or Republican here. I'm talking about biblical things. But you talk about the poor, you talk about caring for the poor, you talk about advocating for them, you point out where scripture talks about it, you point out where Jesus says, look, anything you've done for the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. Like I was sick, I was hungry, I was in prison, you helped me, you fed me, you clothed me, right? It's obvious that scripture cares about it, God cares about it, but there was a pushback. And now I think like the pushback has been so strong from here, pointing out biblically where we are mandated by scripture and mandated by God as Jesus followers to care for the poor that people can't really argue about it anymore. Like it's obvious. Okay. And that was happening literally like 15 years ago. I would have conversations with people about this and they'd be like, well, my tax money takes care of that. I'm not really called to do that. And these were people that were like leaders in the church. <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? Look at the Bible. Look what scripture says. Right. And again, my black Christian friends, man, my friends of color within the church, they, this was like a no-brainer always. Because again, like because of slavery and because of Jim Crow and segregation, like black folks were historically marginalized and pushed into poor communities because of redlining and all that. 
So the black church has always cared for the poor. And there hasn't been a dispute about, oh, well, those liberal Christians care for the poor. And us conservative Christians care about eternity. Right? Like, it was never a dispute. And now I think evangelicals can't deny that this is important. I think even most fundamentalists can't deny that this is important. But now here's where we come to the hot button. You ready for this? You knew it was coming. Race. The race issue. <laughs> it's like the current dividing thing in the church. Again, you got to know, fundamentalists, historically racist, Bob Jones, uh, Bob Jones College, you know, like, Jerry Falwell Sr. was historically racist. We got to like know about this stuff. This, this is true, okay? There were segregationists that were in the fundamentalist movement. Evangelicals tried to separate themselves from that, but would never go over the line totally to advocate too much, even when Billy Graham did at times. Like, he'd be like, oh, I can't go too far. He would for a little bit, but he always felt like Martin Luther King went too far with the race issue, right? And again, obviously when it comes down to it, the black church... Yes, like when it comes to issues of race and justice, look at the book of Exodus, look at Moses leading the Israelites out of Egypt, out of slavery, right? And God literally destroying the Egyptians for enslaving the Egyptians. Does God care about justice? Yeah. I mean, look at the prophets, look at Amos, you know, look at Ezekiel, look at Isaiah, look at Jeremiah, who advocated for the underdog, for the minority, for the marginalized. Does God care about the underdog, yes. Does God care about those who are being mistreated? Yes. Does God care to make equality possible? Of course. Jesus' ministry. He literally uses Samaritans as examples of, you know, what it means to be faithful in loving your neighbor when he's confronting the Pharisees who were racist against Samaritans or nationist against Samaritans. Same type of thing, but it was like, they're from this country of apostate people. We're like the true chosen people. This issue of race. And then again, we look into 2020 and all this stuff. And well, we look through all history. But 2020, George Floyd is brutally murdered for a minute. Evangelicals are like willing to come over here for a second and have these conversations. And then all of a sudden, uh, Donald Trump makes a mandate in September of 2020 leading up to the election, trying to ban all critical race theory teaching, essentially like banning diversity training. And all of a sudden, all the evangelicals are like, no, nope, we're not going to talk about race anymore. We got to stay over this line. This line is so important. We, we can't cross this line. And I'm not even arguing about critical race theory here. I'm not arguing about wokeness. I'm not arguing about Marxism or whatever. A lot of those things have become straw men that have been made up like to label people that are trying to have this conversation biblically, that are trying to lovingly have it, that have nothing to do with any of that stuff, that have nothing to do with secular theory, that have nothing to do with like radical politics that are way over here, right? I mean, we're just trying to have the conversation about race biblically. And of course, my black and people of color, Christian brothers and sisters, like, willingly openly have this conversation and this dialogue and we're trying to figure it out together and then i talk about it and both people on this side and people on this side get mad about it well you have some of these people that are kind of you know mad about it and lean this way and then some that are like i'm willing to go here but i'm like afraid because like i'm going to be marginalized by my friends and this is why i think tim keller brings up a good point that maybe we need to re vamp this word and say, listen, man, if you're not willing to like talk biblically about these controversial issues, okay, that really matter to God, that God has a lot to say about, maybe you're more this and you're less this. If we want to even redeem that term evangelical, which we also could throw it out. Like, does it even matter to God? Like God wants Jesus followers, faithful Jesus followers, right? I mean, just because we're dipping into this realm where progressive theologically, people that are progressive theologically are willing to hang and probably emphasize all this stuff, you know, doesn't mean that we're being unbiblical and we have to deny all this stuff. I've literally heard a list lately where it's like, here's a list of heresies to look out for. And it says like, you know, denial of the Trinity, denial of Jesus as being the only way, denial of the virgin birth, denial of the authority of scripture, you know, denial of the humanity and deity of Christ. And then it also adds woke or CRT. 
And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's an oversimplification. It's intellectually lazy, you know? Because not everybody who's trying to biblically have a conversation about race is pushing Marxism or is pushing secular theory. There might be some overlap there with the scriptures that we need to see the nuance of, right? But we need to talk about this stuff and we need to actually come up with biblical answers. And I think it's the same as the conversation about the poor in the 2000s, where so many people over here are like, we're not having this conversation because it crosses the line politically that we're not okay with. Well, who cares? You think God cares about your politics more than he cares about your heart? You think God cares about you, like your faith or your politics? You think God cares more about where you land politically, like whether you're red enough or whether you're blue enough? Or do you think God cares about you being faithful to his word and scripture and loving your neighbor as yourself? Which one is it? It's a good conversation to have. Thank you, Tim Keller, for making this article. Hopefully it will continue the dialogue and continue to help us to redefine our boundaries in the future, y'all. Peace.